Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for adramofoutlander.com. For all things Outlander, from the Diana Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between. This is episode 109, First Wife, season 3, episode 8. Welcome back. We have had another week of Outlander. Oh, it's getting tragic. There's only five more episodes left until we go through another Droughtlander, waiting for season four, which is filming now. So quickly to bounce off of last week, we ended with the print shop burning to the ground, Fergus having to handle Percival's man, sending... Yi Chen Cho to get hidden and to take young Ian back to Lollybrock. And also, Jamie's secret was exposed that he has a wife. So, many of those things we deal with in this episode, except we don't see Fergus or Yi Chen Cho yet. They will come back later. Presumably next episode is when I think we will see them again. So when it came to listener feedback, the biggest complaint that people had about last week's episode is it felt really rushed and they didn't like Claire's attitude about wanting to heal the man who attacked her. They didn't understand that at all whatsoever. And her attitude when Jamie was talking to her. Well, I think she was processing and she was in shock. I mean, she didn't expect to be back for 24 hours and having to do major surgery and then have the guy die after being attacked by this man. It's a lot to take in, right? And I think this is tough on Claire. The first time she found herself there was difficult, but she learned to roll with the punches, but in her memory, it may have been a little bit simpler and easier than it actually was. Time can color things, and they can be romanticized a little bit. So that was the main complaint from last week's episode, that the writing just felt clunky. Things felt kind of off, and I agreed with that wholeheartedly. So this week, for the early viewers, we're looking at the spoiler threads. People are very positive about this episode. There's only a couple of minor questions. Like, why did Claire not bring up Brianna? I have no idea. Since Jamie never told Jenny about William... Maybe Claire thinks it's Jamie's job to tell her. I don't know. Honestly, no idea whatsoever. <laughs> but all in all, it has been very, very positive. And I found this episode to be quite excellent. I really like this director, Jennifer Getzinger, and it was written by Joy Blake. I found... It to be really cohesive, coherent, and even though a ton of material was put into this hour episode, it didn't feel rushed or crammed at all. It had a really excellent flow to it. The music was really pertinent and, as always, really, Bear is a genius. And I thought that the subtlety and the fierceness, and all the emotions that everybody displayed really came across truthfully. And it felt like there was absolute balance between the characters and how the episode played out. It was really easy to get immersed in this episode. But that said, there's so much detail Watching it a second time, I caught things that I did not see the first time at all. 
And I think this requires more than one viewing. I think most of the episodes of the season do in order to see things that you would miss if you only watch it once and to really process the immensity of material coming at you <laughs> requires probably more than one viewing of nearly all the episodes. So I found it fascinating. And one of the things that I noticed that Sam Hewen did after they arrived and Jenny and Ian confronted them in the courtyard, that one of Jamie's tells is that he taps his fingers when he's nervous or worried and he was tapping his fingers on his strap. So I missed that the first time through. Absolutely. But all the actors had to really display a pretty broad range and to deal with some pretty difficult content. <laughs> so how I set up this podcast episode was we're going to go over the star synopsis, the key players, and then all the key action that was going on or what was attended to in the episode. And then we'll go over favorite quotes from the episode and what I think is to come. Okay, so let's get going. So the star synopsis from the website is Claire returns to Lollybrock with Jamie where she does not receive quite the reception she was expecting. Unbeknownst to her, Jamie's made some choices in their time apart which come back to haunt them with a vengeance. Bom, bom, bom. Yeah, Claire knew something was up, but she had no freaking idea that it was a wife, even though I think in the background, somewhere in the back of her mind, she wouldn't have been surprised. And it's not so much him having had a marriage. It was with who he had the marriage. Tricky, tricky stuff. Now, one of the funny things about this is my husband, who you know has not read the books. I keep trying to get him to. He still hasn't. Maybe he'll do my Drums of Autumn read along with me. He figured out who the wife was. Just by process of elimination, he figured out who it was. <laughs> I'm like, that sort of took the steam out of it. I wanted to really get his reaction. Of course, I didn't tell him he was right. I just let the episode play out, but still. Sheesh. <laughs> so who do we meet in this episode? Of course, Claire and Jamie, young Ian, Jenny, Ian, young Janet, their daughter, Leary, Joan, who's also called Joni, Marsley and Ned Gowan. Yes, I think we all have a little bit of a crush on Ned Gowan. Totally love him. He is amazing. So, the scenarios that happened in this episode. Unlike the last few where I went through episodes step by step, because it was simpler with how the episode was set up, I'm going to go through the key things that happened and pretty much in order to the episode, the best I could put it back together in my notes, but really just taking each of those scenes and each of the situations and looking at it individually. So the first one is Claire and Jamie bringing young Ian home. I mean, Jamie lied to Ian. Jamie exposed young Ian to a life of criminal pursuits and activities. I mean, Jenny and Ian are rightfully angry over the situation. They were scared to death for their son. He ran away again. And last episode, Ian went all the way to Edinburgh from Lollybrock. The Highlands to Edinburgh are pretty far. It would take him several days by horseback uncomfortably so to his face Jamie lied okay 
So they're very upset about their son. And he's their baby. He's not Jamie's son. Even though Jamie said he was treating him like his own, he's not. And that is a theme to pay attention to, is fatherhood is important to Jamie. And we've seen that already when he stayed to be by Willie's side but couldn't raise him and put him in the trust of Lady Isabel and Lord John. He sent Claire back through the stones and Frank loved on his child, Brianna. And so he has this nephew who loves and adores him and runs away to be with him. And he is somewhat of a father figure to him. But the things that he's having him do are probably not the greatest idea. But I also think that Ian and Jenny, probably Jenny more so, sort of babies him and doesn't want him to grow up because he's her youngest. And she worries about him. But he has an adventurous spirit. He has his Uncle Jamie's idea of a good time. And unlike his parents, farm life may not be for young Ian, right? So as this plays out, Ian and Jenny are both angry. They're yelling at them. Young Ian tries to tell about it, and he's a disaster in the making. He just makes it so much worse. And... I love John Bell. He really makes young Ian shine, and I can see him progressing in this role. I mean, his face, it's such a sweet face. <laughs> and this whole situation sort of causes a rift. And they send young Ian outside to wait for his punishment because they want to talk to Jamie alone. Now, Elder Ian hands Jamie his belt so Jamie could handle the punishment, but young Ian is 16 years old. Is a thrashing what he needs? Well, Jamie thinks he can come up with something better for him to do as a punishment versus getting spanked, right? Or belted, as it were, out by the fence. And in the process of this, we have to deal with the fact of Claire returning after 20 years with no word in between. I mean, Jenny is raging over this, too. She's very cold to Claire. She calls her a stray when they're arguing about young Ian. And she cannot reconcile to herself, Jenny can't, how Claire could just have poofed with no sign, no word, no nothing. And this plays through the entire episode. After the young Ian thing, and he's sent out, and they've hashed that out to some degree, Claire is going through the house, and she sees grandchildren running through, and then wee Jamie, who's now an adult, and his fourth baby has just been born, who he's holding. And Jenny won't let... Claire see baby Benjamin because she doesn't want the baby to be confused about a strange face. And her coldness transferred to wee Jamie. He doesn't remember Claire. And the way he treats her is pretty rude. So Jenny has been harboring this. And whether or not it was something that she's harbored out loud to her children over the 20 years, or if it was because Elder Ian came home from Edinburgh and told them that Claire was back, just back, and that she was in the colonies all that time. So it's a big deal. And Claire is affronted. She's not expecting the anger and the coldness and the you are out of my circle of trust, you are dead to me. But that's how Jenny is treating her. And it even goes beyond that. Because we find out that Jenny is behind the debacle that has a certain someone showing up at the house. 
and that's how mad she is at Claire. She is mad at Claire for, let's see, abandoning them, abandoning her brother, never giving a word, not being there and suffering with the rest of them, allowing them to grieve all this time. And it's a mess. She's mad at Claire because of what happened to Jamie. He was a ghost. He was a shell of a human being. And she wasn't there to help the family. So Jenny has had 20 years to be pissed at Claire for all sorts of things, whether or not they were Claire's fault. And she was even throwing in Claire's face that, you know, since she's been back just a week, that a man is dead and she's been attacked and the printer's burned down and Jamie's being wanted by the law. Well, of course, none of that is Claire's fault. That All that would have happened whether or not she was there. There would have been an excise man in Jamie's room and he could have stumbled upon this guy or one of the women who worked at the brothel or Fergus or young Ian. Anybody could have stumbled on him, right? Well... With the one-eyed man working for Sir Percival, who was in the print shop, that same thing would have happened. So these things were brewing whether or not Claire was there. But Jenny's blaming Claire, even though Jamie finds his own trouble all the time. So this is a big deal. This tells me that Jenny, who's fiercely proud, she's fiercely loyal, but she's also judgmental and she's critical and she's kind of controlling and she's upset by the disruption of Claire. She accepted Claire into her life and into their family, and then she left, and now she's back. It's a lot for everyone to handle. And the only one who's taking it really well is young Ian. And then young Janet and elder Ian are taking it fine. But this is a problem, it seems like. And it's going to really take work on Claire's part to be reintegrated to the family and to be trusted. And as the episode develops, you know, we have to look at that reparation between specifically Jenny and Claire because Jenny is the matriarch of the family. So we have that going on, right? And that really played and bled through the whole entire episode until we got to the last quarter of it. And then we start seeing some resolve in the situation. But I'll talk about the repair a little bit separately. So the next scenario that we have to contend with, it's like two and one, is Jamie repairing his relationship with Ian and his relationship with Jenny. Well, Elder Ian and Jamie are like brothers. They basically adopted each other as young men. They were in France together doing like mercenary kind of work. They've known each other their entire life, basically. And... They can come to agreements much better. And as Jamie said to Claire during this episode, that he and Jenny are always at loggerheads. Always. So it's hard to manage. So Jamie has found that alternate punishment for young Ian, and he's making these little fuel cakes or bricks. Dolls, they called them, I think. I have to look it up. Basically, it's a mixture of manure and hay and some other things, it looks like. Yucky, dirty work. And he'd have preferred a thrashing. <laughs> this was more embarrassing, and it kind of got to his pride. So he had to work it off. But Jamie comes out to talk to Ian, who's watching over his son, do this 
punishment, and Jamie apologizes. And Ian also tells Jamie he thinks he's right about young Ian. Like, this, this kid is meant for something else. He might not be meant for farm life. And it's funny because Jamie totally could do farm life, but his adventurous spirit and his willingness to go all the way to protect and preserve and to do all the necessary things means he runs off quite a bit. And I don't think he'd be a great steward of his farm unless he had a superintendent or something to oversee it for him. <laughs> but it's pretty simple for Ian and Jamie to make their way back to each other. Now, he goes to look for Jenny at this point. And this is different. He doesn't go and apologize to her. He goes to her and tells her that young Ian is not a child and he shouldn't be treated that way because she thinks he should have had a thrashing like their father would have given to Jamie. And she doesn't receive it very well at first, right? She and her brother are kind of knock heads. It reminds me of how me and my brother would be together in such situations. There would be sparks and then we would make up. Absolutely. We have that kind of thing going on. But one of the things that Jamie said was that basically she and Ian should give young Ian freedom while he still thinks it's theirs to give him. She doesn't like him telling her this at all. And then she decides to change the subject after being rather sharp with him. And she brings up the fact that it's a mortal sin for him to be married to another wife while the other still walks the earth. So now we're getting to what's really pissing her off, right? She's not happy about this. <laughs> and it tells me that she's really hurt and angry. And I think Jenny feels things very deeply and she takes them really personally, as well as the controlling, meddling, trying to do what's best, but getting in people's way sometimes, those types of things. We know Jamie never would have married somebody else if he thought Claire was alive. And he says that to her. And it's evident that he needs to tell her something about what happened for her to be in any way okay with what's going on. Because she said he never allowed her into his grieving. He never talked about it. Basically, he said Claire was gone and dead and that was it. So he goes into the story about arranging passage to the colonies because he meant to die at Culloden and then the little town that Claire had been staying in before departure was raided by the Redcoats and man, woman, child. Everybody was killed. And so he presumed her dead. But in fact, she thought he was dead and made her passage to the colonies and just recently found out that he was alive and came back. So it's a plausible story that they have come up with. It reads okay. And Jenny is still not quite convinced. And, and she says the Claire that she used to know would never have stopped looking for him. So it's not repaired, but they're talking. And she got something from Jamie that she needed, right? Because he can also be very private and very guarded and not share information and be closed-lipped. And that's not what she wanted from him, but she's the same way. And they both can be kind of mean when they get going with what they say. So it's complicated between them. They're both very headstrong and they both want to be right. And they both want to make the decisions. So there we have it. Now, we have an issue that came up. And that is the truth. And that's also kind of a thread in this episode. Lying versus the truth, right? 
and that's why Jamie is in such trouble with his brother-in-law and sister in the first place and that secret he's been carrying that we knew about but poor Claire did not so they're talking and Claire is upset about how Jenny's treating her and she really wishes she could tell her the truth like they did Murtaugh like why can't they and Jamie thought that that was out of necessity and Murtaugh is a worldly guy He's been doing all these things. He's been traveling. And Jenny, she's never left the Highlands. She's never left Lollybrock. Not really. And she never even got as far as the Mackenzies. She never went to her mother's home. So he thinks that she would have too many questions and they couldn't answer them and it would cause more confusion. I don't know. I don't think Jamie's giving his sister enough credit. And he was too quick to say no to telling the truth. What do you think? Do you think they should have figured out how to tell the truth? How does Claire know things ahead of time? How could she give advice? Is she really a white lady? So I don't think it was a misstep. I just wonder why that was chosen and how things will be revealed. So I imagine down the line, young Ian will be told. He'll have to find out. <laughs> or if other people show up from the future later on, that will have to be explained. I don't know. <laughs> when they will say anything. But I think it would have been great if they could have told the truth to Ian and Jenny. So Jamie goes into this story during this conversation and there was supposed to be some bonding going on here between them. They're both sort of ready for bed and he tells the story of the gray lags, the geese that are mated for life and if you kill one, you have to wait for the mate to come and kill the other. Otherwise, the one that's left behind will grieve itself to death. So do you suppose he's talking about he and Claire? <laughs> and that they're mated for life? Yes. Yeah. We get to that at the end. But yes, it's definitely them. And I think he's trying to explain to her how awful it was without her. And that he was incomplete and grieving. And Claire says that she liked to think of birdsong when she would hear it as Jamie talking to her. And she was there for him to look for. And Jamie had also told her in this section about going to the Silkies Island because of what Duncan Kerr said and that she wasn't there, but he found the treasure after found, finding a rock with the Mackenzie marking on it. And it was a valuable chest. And that he had given Lord John the sapphire when he got back to the prison. And explained to Claire that the men needed him. So he went back. So this was a nice little section, and we got to see that bit from previews where he's on Silky Island and he's screaming for her and he's devastated that she's not there. I did find it interesting that since Jamie takes opportunity to like take breaks off or take his shirt off to do hard work that he swam like a quarter mile in his clothes. Just saying, point of interest. So Claire has kissed him and Jamie is working up to confessing his secret. He's getting there. And he said he was hoping to speak to Ned before he could talk to her about it. And that's our next key scenario. Jamie's secret wife and the interruption before he can tell her what's going on. So it's been a week, right? 
ish. And that's it since she's been back. This is a lot of things for her to be handling. And he just hasn't told her yet. He wanted to counsel with Ned first to see what legal grounds they had, what kind of standing they had. And he wants her to listen with her whole heart. So he's preparing her to tell her something awful. <laughs> hmm. At what she hears at first is that Ned is alive and she's super surprised and happy about that. And she sort of misses out on what he's actually trying to say. If he has to consult a lawyer, you know, it's a big deal. So right when he's going to tell her, the door slams open and we hear daddy. And then we hear it again. Daddy, who is that woman? That is Joan, also known as Joni and Marsley. And right behind them, da, 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 is the wife. It is Leary, damn her eyes, McKimmy. Of all the women in Scotland. <laughs> For those of you who have not read the books, this shocked the pants off of you. Could you believe he was married to Leary? Now, I don't think that the season two Old Fox's Lair episode was adequate to set up this future. Because Jamie knowing that Leary tried to have Claire killed at the witch trial and had the ill wishes and was willing to like make out with him when he came back with a wife in season one, you know, she was never a nice girl, right? I had no idea how this setup was going to go. I had no idea how it would play out and make sense and be reasonable for viewers to be like, yeah, I could see that he married her. And on the Facebook page I, and group, I had people trying to figure out what the scenario was. And somebody figured it out. Marcy, Romani Hudson figured it out. <laughs> I was pretty close. But I didn't want her to be right because of Claire basically forgiving Leary, which we knew was not, she didn't really forgive her in season two and wanted Jamie to thank her that that would make Jamie think that Claire would be okay with it. Yeah, right. Seriously, the girl tried to murder Claire. Just because she's not going to hold a grudge doesn't mean she wants Jamie to marry the woman, right? Ha ha. So this scene was phenomenal. Leary just comes in screaming, you're supposed to be dead. And Claire is just dumbfounded. She doesn't know what to do. She's sitting here in her shift while there's a young girl and there's like a tween girl and Leary flipping her crap, right? And as Joni is telling, you know, Ma, Daddy, stop, because Leary and Jamie are like in it. And Jamie's trying to stop Leary. And as this progresses, Leary realizes that Jamie hadn't told Claire yet. And she has a schadenfreude moment where she kind of giggles. He didn't tell you. He's my husband now. <laughs> she didn't say it quite like that, but that's how I heard it. <laughs> and I'm thinking, poor Claire. Poor, poor Claire. And it is escalating. The girls are freaked out. Claire is sitting there shocked and numb and her mind is reeling. And Leary is screaming at her. She calls her an English cunt. You know, calls her a whore. 
And Jamie grabs her physically and pushes her out the door and goes after her. And then the girls go after. <laughs> so this is a big, fat mess that Jamie is in. And who masterminded that whole thing, right? That's how mad Jenny is. So Claire is in this room by herself now. And just moments ago, she's trying to figure out how to reintegrate with the family. And Jamie's telling her that they can build a house on the edge of the land. All that stuff, right? And so Claire, this cracked me up, opens the cupboard to get her clothes. And the clothes equal like a giant armload. Like it's bigger than her body, all the things that she's supposed to put on over her shift. I'm like, man, there is no quick getaway when you have to wear that much clothes. There's just not. You either have to run in your shift in a robe or you have to take the time to put all your clothes on. There's no just stomping out the door because <laughs> you pull on a pair of jeans, throw on a t-shirt, slip on some shoes and boogie, right? You can't really do that when you have all those layers. I just thought that, yeah. Pretty challenging. <laughs> wow. So what do you think about that? And this has to be dealt with. And Jamie comes back and Claire's got this pile of stuff in her hands and she puts it on the bed and she's trying to get dressed. And she's just can't even think straight. And she's so mad and she's trying to figure out what to do. And at first, she thinks that the girls are Jamie's because Joni has red hair. And Jamie does say something really funny about that. But at the end, I'll say all the quotes that I loved in this episode. I have them written down. <laughs> and he says they're not his kids but he cares for them. And so it's setting up why he married Leary in the first place. It will come. We will find out all the detail. It's amazing how mad Claire is. And she's just stammering at him and doesn't quite know what to do. And all people, of all the women, basically... She tried to kill me. And Jamie basically did the guy thing of, but you told me I should be kind to her. <laughs> okay, that is like totally stupid guy thing. Really? <laughs> I didn't want him to do that. But Marcy was right. He did it. That was one of his go-to plays. I'm like, oh no, Claire's going to hit you with something if you say that. <laughs> and Jamie had said that he's a coward. He couldn't stand the thought of losing her once he had her and that he would give up everything for her to be here. Is that a good explanation, do you think? I think it was fear. Really, it wasn't just waiting on Ned. It wasn't all that stuff. I think he was truly scared that she would just turn around and leave. And Claire can do that. She might have. And then this is where it starts to get ugly in this whole scenario of dealing with the secret wife who happens to be Leary. It's the fact that he's angry that she, Claire left him. Just like Jenny is mad. And he throws that in her face that she, she left and Claire loses it at this point. She's on the verge of tears. Her voice is quaking and, you know, she tells him he made her leave. Well, he did make her leave. And she says she would have gladly died at Culloden with him. And no, he really can't blame her because it was for Brianna's sake, right? 
and she thinks he blames her for coming back and he's like no yes no i mean it's so good to watch this it's amazing i had loved this whole scene and this is where i kind of see jamie looking at these 20 years and not romanticizing it but really feeling sorry for himself which Claire didn't really do. Claire isolated herself in her work and she insulated herself and didn't go outside of her marriage with Frank. She just didn't have any intimacy with anyone. It was protect protection for herself. But she really poured all her passion and her heart into her work and into Brianna, right? And into the facade of the marriage she had with Frank. But I think Jamie never could think of her grieving so imagined her and frank having a happy life and having sex and him holding his daughter and he was angry about it like he wants to you know kill her for it kind of thing he's so jealous but he really felt sorry for himself and he never let himself think that maybe claire was just as miserable as he was maybe it would have been too hard for him but that's where He's being selfish, even though he wanted her to be happy, he hoped for that, that harmed him too. It made him angry that at the possibility, even though he sent her back to Frank. So he's mad at her and mad at himself. This is the quote that I want to put in here because I think it's important. Do you know what it is to live 20 years without a heart? To live half a man and accustom yourself to exist in the bit that's left. And I'm like, hell yes, Claire knows. And Claire was like, do I know? Yeah, she screams back at him. <laughs> yes, you bastard, I know. He deserved that. And this is where their fight is escalating. It's interesting. Jamie like growls at her and they're yelling at each other. She, at this one, this point here, is she doesn't have to imagine him with Leary. She's seen him kiss her, like, way, way back in season one. And she grabs it and she shoves her fist into his chest and pushes him. He looks startled. Like, I wondered if that was in the script. I can't wait till it's up on stars so I can read the script. Because I don't know if maybe that was the tenth time she did it or if that was the first time she did it and I caught it. Because... Sam looked genuinely surprised. I love that. That she's just so mad that she wants to punch him. So she just shoves his chest. Which I could see myself totally doing. And then Jamie, like, instead of hitting Claire, turns around and starts breaking shit. Like, knocks over a table, breaks the ewer, and stuff goes everywhere. So, then all she can say is, well, you should have told me, right? Because at first she thought he lied because he said that he never fell in love with anyone else. Well, he hadn't fallen in love with anybody else. And Claire is pretty, now she's mad that he would just marry her and use her and then leave her. <laughs> and then Jamie like gets all in her face about either being a let or a cheating bastard or whatever it is. So they're just getting into this anger and they're finally getting some of this out. I mean, it's only been a week. But they both have these things under the surface that they've been carrying. And Leary showing up was a catalyst for all of this to pour out. He could put voice to his anger that she left, even though she had to leave. To coming back and throwing everything ass over tea kettle, you know, when she comes back. And all that goes with it, because now he can't imagine what her life was. He can ask her what her life was. He can hear the gritty details. He can hear about her pain and suffering too. So there's no more of that imagination station going on, right? They have to deal with each other. So this is where it gets really interesting because he grabs her after she turns away from him and he sort of brutally kisses her like, you're mine. And I was wondering how far they would push this fight. I think it is in the right parameters 
too much physicality I shirk away from because it seems abusive to me, this played really good. And I think it, I think it would have been so much fun to film this scene. No matter how many takes you had to do, it looks like it was awesome. I mean, they just got to let loose and emote <laughs> and be really physical but not hurt each other. They weren't punching each other, pulling hair, scratching, you know, biting each other. Thankfully, I'm so glad for that because it could have been here. We just didn't know what was going to happen, right? So she tries to stop him and he throws her on the bed. Oh, no, before she slaps him and when she reaches back and cracks him, I was like, whoo. Yeah, I would do that. I could see like a slap. And then he throws her on the bed and they roll off onto the floor. Mind you, the entire house is there. It's in the evening. They're in their jammies, right? <laughs> so then it shifts. Now, have, has either of them had a passionate row in a long time? I mean, she had a fight with Frank a couple of years ago, but that ended with them in separate beds and her being embarrassed because of Candy and Sandy. So, <laughs> and with Frank dying, oh no, that fight was a few years before he died. So, you know, it was like a decade, eight years, something. Anyway, she hasn't had a passionate fight in a long time. So sometimes love and hate are really close together. Anger and sex can be close together. And one can rouse the other. And that's what happens here. And he's on top of her. I love you and only you, he says to her. And everything shifts and they start to make out, like roughly, but they start to make out. Like, so they're having immediate makeup sex. <laughs> or he's going to try to. <laughs> Woo! I, that's not a thing for me. I tend not to be somebody who enjoys like a really knockdown drag out fight. I don't, uh, it's from my upbringing, but I can appreciate it in the sense that this was on the screen. I think it played beautifully. It was spot on. It felt real, but it wasn't voyeuristic. Like I didn't feel like I should call 911 on them. I felt like they were having a good fight and it was okay. And then, you know, they're getting kind of hot and heavy on this. And we see whoosh. And a whole bucket of water gets thrown on them. And there's Jenny in her pajamas telling them to knock it off. They're rutting like wild beasts. And they don't care about the household. Uh-huh. And Claire gets up and stumps out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and there's Jamie sitting there with his shirt all askew and just looking at his sister. So, you know, that's the scene of finding out about Leary. <laughs> it was masterfully done. And I think it handled so many different things in one scene. Like the shine is off, man. And they had to get to some of the more important stuff. And that stuff would have had to have been gotten to eventually. Because those emotions and those 20 years of feelings and thoughts and experiences and assumptions about the other, about what their life was, would have to come out. There's a lot of hurt in there. And that... And I did. So those layers were peeled back like very efficiently and very effectively, I thought. Really just masterful. Um, I really enjoyed watching the scene the second time even more when I was taking notes. I was sitting there laughing while I was doing it. You know, and cheering them on. Though in my notes, I totally called Jenny a cock blocker. I'm just saying. <laughs> she totally disrupted, man. They were getting things started. So, they've not concluded hashing this out yet, right? 
there's more that has to be done to repair this. And that comes in its own little section when they're really working toward something together. I thought it was important to mention Ian putting Jenny in her place. Ian Murray is the only person Jenny will listen to, ever. She might take into consideration what other people say, but if he tells her she's being a meddling bism, she won't like it, but she'll listen. He's the one person who can humble her, who can cause her to stop, even if she argues with him. I can be that way. I'm probably way more like Jenny than I would like to admit <laughs> on some level. I'm not a control freak like her, but if I really think I'm right about something and I'm invested, I will argue with you even if I know you're right. And I will get so angry at my husband for telling me something and eventually I come around, but I get really mad, <laughs> but he might be the only one who I can hear it from just how it goes. Some of us are clot heeds, aren't we? <laughs> but Ian telling Jenny how it was, and I think this is the number one quote from the entire episode, that was hilarious. It's not the most endearing, but it's the funniest, was what Ian said to her. But I think this allows her to soften her stance toward Claire. You know, he basically calls her a shit stirrer. And it makes her stop and evaluate what she's doing and why. And she has to own her own emotions and her expectations and her anger and all that 20 year history and disappointment in Claire. And grieving her and missing her and hating what it did to her brother. So there's a lot to unpack for Jenny, but now she can actually give herself permission to do so. And Ian was gentle with her. He told her straight up, but he was kind and he was loving and then he gave her space. I mean, Ian's a good husband. He's the perfect husband for Jenny. <laughs> she had somebody like herself as her spouse, they would just kill each other. It would never work. And we do have to look at Claire confronting Jenny about Leary. I mean, she's sitting by the fire and young Janet, now Jenny's given name is Janet. That's why I'm calling Janet young Janet. And she apologizes to Claire after Claire apologizes for such a mess that happened in the house. And young Janet says it was her fault that Auntie Leary came and she should be the one apologizing. And then Claire finds out, this is when Claire finds out that Jenny indeed sent for Larry. And Claire confronts her. And though ultimately I think what Ian did was starting to soften Jenny. She's not there yet at this point. And Claire asks her why, why would she do that? You know, basically, Larry's his wife and blah, blah, blah. And Claire's like, I'm his wife. <laughs> what are you talking about? And what happens in this moment, coupled with what Ian says to her, moves things in motion and moves things forward for Claire and Jenny to repair the relationship because Claire totally opens up to Jenny and she tells her the truth in as much as she can, right? Keeping in mind what Jamie had said. 
because Jenny is mad that Claire never sent letters, never gave updates, didn't come looking for her brother. And Claire said she was in the colonies. She had another husband. And she had to give, away, give up her past in order for that marriage to work. And that after he died, she wanted to come to Scotland to visit and to see Jamie's grave and talk to him at his gravesite. But then she found out he was alive and here she is. And Jenny hears the truth in it, but she knows Claire is still holding something back. And she asks if Claire ever had children. And she said she never did with Frank, with her husband. Hmm. That poses a question as to why Claire did not say that she and Jamie had a child. But if Jamie didn't tell his sister that Claire was pregnant... then Claire's probably allowing Jamie to do it, like we said in the beginning. I don't know. I don't know why that is. I was trying to remember if Jamie had ever told Jenny that Claire was pregnant when she left. I don't think so. I haven't gone back and rewatched season two. Only a couple of episodes have I rewatched, so I can't remember. If you can remember, let me know. That's a key piece of information. But at this moment, Jenny believes that their relationship is busted and she doesn't know if she can trust her again. She doesn't know. She doesn't even know if she wants to. And she thinks it's just broken. And that's interesting because at the end of the episode, after Jenny finds out of course, that Leary shoots Jamie, um, that they're sitting together on the porch. And Claire says she just wants a second chance. And she listens to Jenny. And Jenny basically said, you're my sister. I just brought you into the family only because my brother chose you. Meaning I love you, and I trusted you, and I grieved for you, and I missed you, and I worried for you, and where were you? And you weren't here, and I'm mad. She was saying all those things. And that she never questioned when Claire would give her advice and tell her to do weird things like plant potatoes. That would save their hides from starving, right? That she just accepted it blindly accepted it without question and Claire you know says that she loved her too and all she's saying is that she loves her brother very much she just wants a second chance in this family and that's it she's here So they're making their way toward reconciliation. And you could see Jenny just melting a little bit. She's very proud. She's not quite there yet, but definitely making strides. That says a lot for Jenny Murray. She holds a grudge, that one. <laughs> We're like, ooh. Okay. So... Jamie and Claire slept in separate places, right? As Ian had said, Jamie had slept in the stables and Claire in the guest room. So Claire is like dressed, got her doctor's bag, and she's right, she's walking. She didn't even have a horse. She's just going to walk out of Lollybrock. Well, Lollybrock probably isn't too far from Inverness. I mean, by walking it is, but she could get there. Eventually. <laughs> but she's ready to leave. She's quite upset. So Jamie's trying to reason with Claire about the scenario. And Claire reminds him of what he said. There can be secrets, but no lies. Those were his words. 
he apologizes. And the pain on her face just made me want to cry, brought tears to my own eyes. And he's assuring her she's the only love he's ever known, ever. And at this point, Leary comes up with a freaking gun in her hand. And she heard their conversation and the loving things that Jamie had said. And now she's really pissed. Like she was coming to shoot somebody anyway. I don't know if it was Jamie or Claire, but now she's got the gun on Claire. And Claire works her way to being behind Jamie. And Leary is there to protect what's hers. And Jamie's trying to talk her down. We haven't lived together for a long time. <laughs> they didn't live together very long. We come to find out later. And Leary's just out of her mind. And even, even if they're not living together, he was taking care of them and she shoots him. Jamie goes down and Claire body checks Leary when Leary starts to go and see if Jamie's okay. Like, I think she would rather have shot Claire, honestly, like she meant to, and she shot him and now she's freaking out. So Claire body checks her, knocks the gun out of her hand, and Leary goes running, right? And Claire's got crazy eyes and tells Leary to leave. <laughs> And the look on Jamie's face is totally fuck my life after he was shot. And he kind of looks up at Leary. <laughs> oh my gosh. I know I haven't cussed as much in these episodes as some of the other ones. But that was exactly the face he had when I interpreted it. And so now we have like the aftermath of him being shot. It's like, Surgeon Claire, activate. Get me some towels. How about some boiling water? I need some candles. Go get my doctor's bag. You know, they have them laid out on the table. And Claire has to evaluate. And, you know, they're using booze as anesthesia, which isn't great because it can depress your respirations. I don't know about bleeding issues with too much alcohol intoxication but that's all they have it's not like she has ether or anything else to knock them out right but the look on jenny's face when claire says that leary shot him yeah that just gave claire some props right there <laughs> i think jenny was like holy crap that was a bad match <laughs> And Jamie's just like, whatever, Claire will fix it. It's fine. And I love being able to see Claire just go into Dr. Claire mode and that she can take care of somebody that she loves and it doesn't freak her out. It just drives her to do well. And young Ian is totally impressed by what she's doing and he's kind of assisting her, you know. Um, and we see her suturing after pulling out the little balls and there was one that was really problematic so young Ian offers her a drink and calls her auntie and it's a really nice bonding moment for the two of them and you know he says that Uncle Jamie is really lucky to have her so it's interesting how quickly young Ian just attached himself to Claire. He trusts her. Doesn't matter what Fergus said. He's like, she's my auntie and I'm just down with her no matter what is going on. So it's successful, right? And now we get to see the beginnings of repair between Jamie and Claire. But Claire is still really pissed. I have never seen anybody angrily check wounds before to make sure everything looked good. But Claire was clearly checking on him in an angry fashion. <laughs> Her bedside manner 
the sucking at the moment. <laughs> it's pretty funny. And he's trying to have humor, and she's just not buying any of it. No. Not even giving in to that. Cuteness. I'm pissed at you. And she wants the story. She wants to know how and why and the what of Leary McKimmy. How did this happen? Right? And it's funny because he doesn't want her to get angry. And she's like, I ha I've, I've stayed angry, so just spill it, basically. <laughs> and he starts to tell her the story. And she sits there and listens. I will say, Claire, this season has handled things a lot better than I generally would. And she needs to hear it. And that is something I think that ultimately she and Jamie have always been allowed to do, is to talk to each other and to hear each other out. And that she and Frank never could get back to that. He could not hear what she had to say. And then she didn't care what he had to say. It was terrible things begetting terrible things and terrible feelings. So she listens. And he explains that it was the first Hogmanay since she was a child that there was a party at Lollybrock. And Jenny transforms the house. And he was happy and sad at the same time because he had been a ghost after Hellwater. He came home and he was a part of himself. So we get that theme of a ghost again. Claire's been a ghost. He's been a ghost. She gets it. like, And he's surprised somehow that she felt the same way. But then he wanted her to have a spectacular life. That's what he hoped she had. And she had a successful life, but it wasn't necessarily a happy life all the way around, right? And she had her own grieving and pain, and he didn't want that for her. So I think he's still looking at her in this idealized way to some degree. And what he's presuming was her life. And he thinks he was lonely. And it was in the spirit of things. And these two girls, which we saw in the beginning, are Larry's daughters, asked him to dance. And it was two years prior. Just about two years. So he and Larry haven't been married long, and they haven't lived together at all, hardly. So when you think of that, they could have only been under the same roof for a couple of months, it seems like. So he danced with the girls, and he tells Claire... It's the first time he remembers laughing since he laughed with her, since she left. Couldn't remember ever laughing since she left. That's tragic. After this dance with the girls, he finds out their mother is Leary McKimmy. Remember, she's a Mackenzie, and that was one of her husband's name. And he was thinking... Well, she's been widowed a couple times. She has two kids that need a father. And it seemed plain enough to him that the things that he couldn't have in his life after Claire left, the things he saw he could have with her, he thought they were gone. He couldn't raise Willie. He didn't get to raise Brianna. But now he has a chance to father these girls and to be a husband. But it was the girls who really attracted him. And Jenny figured it out, too, and then she really urged him in that direction. How sad. But now we're really getting to see the heart of it. That he wanted to be a father. Frank raised Brianna as his own because he wanted to be a father, and there was no other way he was going to do it because he was sterile. Because of circumstances, Jamie could not raise his own children. So he was going to raise the McKimmy girls as his own, as a stepfather. And he fell in love with the girls in spite of their mother, right? Like, she came along with their package deal, not they came along with her package deal sort of thing. That's what I got from it. And so I think it's really interesting how the writers integrated this. Like he sort of said, well, you told me to be kind to her, but that wasn't at the heart of it. Time had passed, and 
These girls needed somebody, and he could be that somebody for them. And he needed that purpose. Gosh, that was so well done. That was so quiet. And to have her sit and just listen to him and give him that space. And then Claire wants to know what happened. Like, how did he end up in Edinburgh, right? He explains how he tried to be gentle and care for Leary, but she wouldn't talk to him for days or weeks on end. And if they were talking, they were fighting. And then when it came to the marriage bed, well, there was fear in her eyes. One of her husbands must have been cruel to her. He doesn't know, but he tried to be gentle, but he only saw fear. He couldn't stand to see that when he went to touch her, so he left. But he loves the girls and wanted to provide for them still. That is so tragic. I mean, none of us wanted him to marry Leary, right? I mean, match destined in hell, but for him to be so hurt trying to do what his heart desired, she couldn't do it with him. Leary was damaged. She didn't have it to give. You know, she wanted him, but she didn't have the capability of being in a relationship that he knew could exist, like what he had with Claire. He wanted, even if he couldn't have that again, he wanted something companionable and kind and decent. And she could not do that. So Claire just sat and took that in. She was able to be understanding, and her own stance just softened. It doesn't mean things are going to be perfect, right? It doesn't mean that there aren't going to be doubts or questions. But she could see it, and she could hear it from him, and receive it from him in a non-threatening way. And I love that. Because he does have reparations to make outside of her pat impassioned outrage, right? And so the next step is kind of dispatching of Leary since the marriage is invalid, right? And one of the things I didn't talk about earlier was Jamie talking to little Joni and saying that he would still take care of them. He would take care of the girls. But there wasn't a bond between him and her mother. It wasn't going. It wasn't meant to last. And that honesty to, you know, to this young girl, I think, is really important. And I think it's going to be foundational <laughs> in things that are coming. To s even if there might be not such positive impact, as I'm sure that Joni will share that with Marsley right? Her older sister. So how are they going to dispatch of this, of Leary, of this invalid marriage? Because Claire's back and alive. So enter Ned Gowan. I love Ned Gowan. I have a crush on him. <laughs> He's my favorite. And his secret to not aging after he and Claire have this really sweet reunion is that he's never married. So Ned has to be in his early 80s by now. And he and Claire are just tickled pink at seeing each other. They have a special relationship. They built it on the road. And the three of them, Claire and Jamie and Ned, are sitting at the table and they're kind of hashing everything out because they have to figure out how to deal with Leary. Now, it turns out Leary has filed a complaint against Jamie with the law and it would probably hold no water because he thought that Claire was dead but the other issue is that Leary owned and discharged a firearm which is still illegal in the Highlands for Scots to own weapons such as that and Claire wants revenge man she wants her to be punished which I totally understand And 
basically what it comes down to, they could turn her in and have her charged, but could they prove it was hers except for the holes in Jamie and that Claire and Jamie both saw her do it? She could go to jail or she could be transported to the colonies and then her daughters would have no father and no mother. Well, that's not okay. Jamie's not going to stand for it. He's too honorable, right? So they just decide to like, they hid the weapon, it's done. But Leary wants alimony. That's the only way she's going to go quietly and she's not going to continue with these charges against Jamie. And it's a crap ton of money, we come to find out. Well, does Jamie have any money? No. His print shop just burnt down, right? He has some money from the profits he'd just made, but he gave a bunch of those out. So they have a plan to make her go away because the marriage is considered never to have taken place because his wife is there, but he still needs to take care of her. So he agrees to give a sum of hush money <laughs> and then an annual sum for the girls until they're old enough to get married. So whatever. Like it or not, I think it's reasonable. Goes for it. So one of the things that happened, you know, Claire brought her penicillin and we saw her kit unfold when she was doing the little minor surgery on Jamie and suturing him. But he ends up being fevered when they're sitting there having their long conversation and reestablishing connection with each other. So she injects him with penicillin. That stuff hurts. I don't know if you're old enough to remember of ever getting an intramuscular injection of antibiotics. It is horrendous. It hurts like hell. So Jamie had a right to be totally scared of that needle. <laughs> totally. Because it, it burns and it's thick. The last time I had to have an IM injection was I got mastitis when my youngest was 10 months old, so 15 years ago, and I had such a large mastitis infection site that I could not do oral antibiotics because I could have ended up at the hospital because it was so serious and my fever spiked so high so quickly that the nurse at our family practitioner's office had to give me an injection in my butt. I had forgotten because I hadn't had one since I was a little kid. I rarely take antibiotics. Man, my whole entire bum cheek hurt for the, like, the whole rest of the day. My leg was stiff. So I totally feel for Jamie. So if you've never had an injection in your ass of antibiotics, seriously, you are not missing out. It's terrible. <laughs> but that's her first use. And we don't know how many doses she gave him. So that's just something to think about. Like, how much does she have left? Okay. So the next order of business that, you know, we had to look at is how are they going to pay for getting rid of Leary, right? Well, Jamie had told Claire about the treasure on Silky Island, but now he gets to tell Ian and Jenny about it. And that he can go, but he can't swim, obviously, because his arm's in a sling. He can go and get it, go to France, have Jared help him exchange some of it for money, for sterling, and give it, come back and give it to Leary. So that's the plan. It's a solid plan, right? Young Ian wants to go swim to Silky Island for him, Woot woot. They make Ian, young Ian leave, but, you know, Jamie would really like him to come with them, and he thinks it's a good plan, and Jenny agrees that Ian can go, so does Elder Ian, and, you know, Jamie and Claire promise that young Ian will be safe. He'll do a better job with him. I'm like, oh, immediate foreshadowing. <laughs> so they work it out. So things are kind of on even keel with all of them, right? And, you know, the last bit of business 
is them going to Sophie's Island near Ardsmuir it's in the western coast and it's a very rocky cliff and young Ian has to go down to the beach and then swim and get into the current get the box and come back it's not a great time of year for it right so they see him swim out he gets to the island and then Jamie wants to know why Claire won't look him in the eye and she's having doubts you know she's wondering if leaving Boston was worth it was coming worth it it's been so much harder than she thought it would and you know she's kind of vomiting her doubt which I think we probably all would have even if we don't want to admit to it it doesn't matter is she loving a memory or is reality going to be okay is it going to be too much I mean she was trying to say it wasn't too bad was it like our lives were okay no that their lives sucked without each other frankly but she's trying to justify it now because she's having these feelings and she's worried and what I liked about this is that Jamie was able to tell her they need each other tell her they're mate mated for life tell her how much he loves her he could reassure her and tell her you are meant to be here with me that's what they need that's salve for Claire because he didn't get mad at her for doubting he just told her she doesn't have to and they're in it together forever because she's not saying she's leaving but it's been a hard week for Claire <laughs> week in a few days now and it's been a lot for her to take in as she needs to process and that's one of the ways it's coming out and I think we would have doubts like I can't turn water on and everything is difficult and there's no communication and was it really that bad yeah it was really that bad Claire <laughs> for both of you and then Claire sees there's a ship coming out from behind Seal Island and there's a boat going to shore and young Ian is captured put into this little boat and put on the ship and they sail away I love the effect of seeing the ship have the sails come up and they look like they're going further away but then we see Jamie and Claire on the shore and they're getting smaller and smaller it was a great directorial effect and so I love this episode I thought like I said in the beginning it flowed well everything worked together the characters seemed to like appropriate in their own skins like everything clicked in I'm so happy I feel like season three is so redemptive I mean if you didn't start listening to the podcast until this season well I wasn't so happy about season two I wasn't happy with the season one finale and I thought season two was very rough as an offering But I feel like the season has totally redeemed the process. It hasn't all been 100%, but what show is. I was concerned after last week's episode that we were kind of going back downhill again, but this one is amazing. And I thought they did a great job. And I'm glad to report that. Yay! Um, so what are my favorite episodes? My favorite episodes. Ha ha. My favorite quotes from this episode. Let me pull them out. Jenny's saying, you had my son selling liquor and consorting with criminals. Jenny's saying, I don't want to bewilder the Baron with a strange face now. To Claire not seeing baby Benjamin. It's very complicated. You must listen with all your heart. And Jamie was about to tell Claire about Leary. Daddy, who is that woman? Marsley. 
Leary saying, you're supposed to be dead. <laughs> and calling her a whore and all sorts of other things. She tried to have me killed. You're the one that told me to be kind to the lass. I told you to thank her, not marry her. Claire and Jamie. Do you know what it is to live 20 years without a heart? To live half a man and accustom yourself to exist in the bit that's left? Jamie. I am his wife, Claire. Did you think we were all frozen in time waiting for you to return? Jenny to Claire. I love that line. Bit of foreshadowing. Or, hmm. Yeah, they were frozen in time, Declare. They were all dead when she was back in the 20th century. Number one line of the week from the writer's room. There's a pot of shite on to boil. You stir like it's God's work. <laughs> Elder Ian, calling his wife Jenny, a shit stirrer. That's right. He put her in her place. <laughs> Leary saying, that's the truth of it then when she comes with a gun, because she heard Jamie telling Claire she's been the only love in his life. I'll never understand what you saw in that woman, Claire. Jenny telling Claire about her vision, that she was standing betwixt Leary and Jamie at the altar. I never took off his wedding ring, Claire. Second writer's room quote of the episode. I hear Virginia is nice this time of year. In case they decided to get Leary transported for the gun. Jamie saying to Claire on that cliff after she had her doubts. Will you risk the man I am for the sake of the one you once knew? And him saying being a printer was not to being your husband. Woo, this ended up being a long podcast. Thank you for playing along. So what do I think is to come? Well, Jamie and Claire have to figure out what the ship's name is that he's on. There's no name on the side of it like today or number. Where it's going so they can follow him and get him back. And I was said, hello, South Africa, black sales, filming locations. Jamie has to tell his sister and Ian, that young Ian was kidnapped when he was getting the treasure. They have to come up with money to pay Leary's hush money. And people are wondering, when do we find out about Murtaugh? I don't know. I don't know what episode that will be. I also think that we will see Fergus and Yi Chen Cho next episode because this is where the ship portion of the season comes. And I know you've all seen previews and all the information. So... The next chapter of their wild adventure really begins. So where can you find A Dram of Outlander? On Facebook, the Dram of Outlander page. And please go to the group. It's really interactive. A Dram of Outlander group. There's some questions you have to answer. Please do, and I'll add you. On Instagram and Twitter, it's Dram of Outlander without the A in front. And how do you get involved? Well, Wednesday nights, there's a standing Twitter chat under hashtag ADOO. And we meet at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. And thank you to a bootlander for filling in when I had to go catch a baby last week. I'm so appreciative. The chat looked fabulous without me. So thank you for jumping in. Go on to the page and the group and join in. The difference between the page and the group is the group you can post and interact with others easily. On the page, I can post and you guys can interact with my posts. Everyone's not going to see your post. It's been great already, even though it's a young group. I just started it a few months ago. Go on to Twitter and talk to me. That's always fun. 
How can you support the podcast? Number one, share it. Share the link. Tell people to listen. Go into iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play if you listen through a streaming service and please leave a review that will help people find me. Go to the website, share posts that I've written that helps bring more people in as well. You can financially support the podcast by a one-time offering. You can email or call in to get information. Or you can go to patreon.com slash a dram of Outlander and do a monthly offering as low as a dollar. Every penny counts. <laughs> and if you want to send me your comments, questions, thoughts, wild theories of things to come, you can email contact at adramaboutlander.com or call into the voice line 719-425-9444 and leave a message to be included in a future podcast. And hey, if you'd like to come on and be a co-host for part of the podcast, drop me a line or an email and we'll see what we can arrange. I always want your feedback and want to know what I'm doing well what you'd like me to do more of or stop doing altogether. And I love for you to interact and I want to hear your voices too. You're the reason I do this podcast week in and week out. Now, remember, as soon as the season ends for TV, I will be starting a Drums of Autumn read along. It will last approximately 11 months. I'm working on my schedule right now. Season four is filming, but it probably will be a decent drought lander, hopefully not as long as this last one. And for the medical side of things, outlandermedicine.com, Karen Doherty, who's my Outlander Science Club other half, is putting posts up to go with the episodes. And I still plan on getting some Outlander Science Club episodes up that are bonuses for you. I just had a busy midwife week and wasn't able to do it. I had three babies in five days, but I'm on a little break right now. So thank you so much for listening. And I can't wait to hear back from you. Happy downloading. And until next time, Slange of awe.